Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin and on this channel I upload all sorts of videos revolving around true crime education and psychology topics. And welcome back to another instalment of True Crime Week. If you haven't already watched any of my videos this week, I'm uploading a video every single day relating to a true crime case. So don't forget to have all your notifications turned on so you don't miss an upload this week. And for today's video, we're going to be discussing another John Doe case and this is that of Regina John Doe. Before we get started, I'm just going to zoom through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel I'm simply relaying the information I'm able to find myself through research of certain sources on the internet and because only certain sources are accessible to me it means I may get things wrong leave things out or mispronounce things and if I do any of these things I do apologize I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or an injustice I'm simply working with the information that I have available to me so now that that's out of the way we should just go ahead and get started discussing the case of the Regina John Doe. This case begins on Friday the 28th of July in the year of 1995 when police received a phone call at around 3.40 p.m. reporting a possible death. The local authorities set out to the Canadian Pacific Railway crossing located on 13th Avenue and Courtney Street in a place called Regina in Saskatchewan. The officers had met with two men who were working for the rail company and they'd informed officers that they'd seen a man pull himself out of a ditch on the side of the tracks and move himself in the path of an incoming eastbound train. The workers, upon realising what they had seen, had been unable to alert and stop the train as it approached the crossing since it was a very large train carrying around 104 boxcars, travelling at around 70 kilometres per hour. At the crossing itself, the control barrier had been lowered down to prevent anyone from travelling over the crossing, as well as there being red warning lights, so it had been clear for anyone in the area that there was a train incoming. But according to these railway workers the man had ignored these warnings and he was sadly killed on impact. And because of the nature of this sighting provided by the witnesses the police investigators had been adamant that his death had been the result of a suicide but the authorities had yet to find the identity of the victim. According to the police reports the victim was a Caucasian male placed at being between 20 and 30 years of age. He had seemed well kept and clean shaven, he had short brown hair, blue eyes and believed to have been at around 5 foot 9 inches is tall. At the time of his death he had been wearing a black denim shirt with a gold logo on the front left pocket. Underneath this denim shirt he had a white t-shirt with Boca Authentic written on the front in red and black lettering. He was also wearing blue jeans, white socks and a pair of blue and white Reebok trainers. Interestingly though about these trainers I read that he was wearing these in a size 12 and a half when they actually measured his foot size and he was actually only a size 9 and 3 quarters. He had been found with a sack of items that were believed to have been his personal belongings but when the contents of this sack were searched the authorities weren't able to find any form of identification. They did find some clothing pieces as well as some other miscellaneous items but nothing that gave them any indication of who he was. And when they searched his person they discovered that in his pocket there was a rose shaped silver brooch which was often known as the Christmas rose and since investigators had no indication of who he was or where he was from their first port of call was to compare his his fingerprints with that of any previous fingerprinting data and their search spread over all of the local cases over the whole country as well as over into the United States and then eventually internationally. Their ever-expanding search brought up no matches meaning that he wouldn't have ever been in trouble with the law so there was no previous record of his fingerprints. His lack of tattoos or distinguishable scars or anything along those lines meant that investigators really had very little to go on. They began to search through local missing persons reports to see if he matched any of the descriptions of these missing people but no matches could be found in the general area and as with many unidentified victims they collected x-rays, dental records, DNA samples and photographs in order to continue their search. A composite drawing of the victim was released into the media in hopes of someone coming forward and recognising this John Doe in addition to pieces of information and a description relating to the victim's appearance and belongings. The extensive media coverage had reached further than Regina and a number of potential matches were reported from other areas of Canada as well as in the US actually but when each of these had been chased up and none of them matched the exact description of the doe they decided they had to keep searching. 
One particular lead, though, had appeared to have had potential, and it had come from a witness who told authorities that he believed he'd been with the John Doe in the couple days leading up to his death. According to this man named Randy Wakelin, he had met the man while they were both hitchhiking on the 22nd of July. Their journey together had taken them from Strathmore, Alberta, to Swift Current, where they then travelled to Regina on the 24th of July. During their travels, Randy had gotten to know a little bit about this man, but he didn't get to know his name. He knew that he sometimes called himself Brian, and he also sometimes went by the names Dave or David. And this man had told Randy that he was originally from Ontario, although he wasn't entirely sure if this was true, and he enjoyed a number of kind of high-end things like expensive cars, he enjoyed talking about politics, and what was described by Randy as preppy music. According to the description that Randy had provided authorities with, he said that this Dave or Brian or whatever his name had been had been entirely alien to the hitchhiking lifestyle and he had no knowledge or experience with drugs, street slang and he just re didn't really know how to hitchhike. He'd given Randy the impression that he had been very well educated, he'd worn nice clothes and he'd mentioned university and a fraternity house at some point in a conversation and Randy had also picked up on an instance where he had said that he may head back out east. Randy said that he had amazing manners but he struggled to hold eye contact when speaking to someone and he would always place a napkin on his lap whenever they'd go out for dinner even though the majority of the time they would just visit fast food restaurants. He also told authorities that he had a diary that he carried everywhere with him and a silver fountain pen and he would write in this diary every single day, although strangely, this diary has never been found by the authorities. Investigators had some theories regarding to where he may have been from because of this description that had been provided by Randy Wakelin and they were relatively confident that he was not homeless or a drifter or if he had, he hadn't been so for long. It's believed that Dave and Brian weren't his real name and in regards to whether or not he was in fact from Ontario, it couldn't really ever be confirmed as investigators had not been able to match his description with any missing persons reports from those areas. This John Doe case does seem particularly baffling to me because if he really is as well-spoken and well-mannered as believed, he would have likely come from quite a well-off background and with him being so young, it seems very likely that there will be someone out there who is his friend or a family member who would know who this John Doe is. The Regina John Doe was buried in Regina Riverside Cemetery. His grave was marked with a gravestone that was actually gifted from a woman named Barbara Beck. Barbara Beck was a woman who had been working regularly in Regina at the time of the John Doe's death and when she'd heard that he was to be buried under no name and that no one had claimed his body, she decided to donate the headstone herself. To my knowledge, the cold case unit in the Regina Police Department does continue to search for an identity in the case and I do hope with the, with the constantly improving DNA technology there will be some answers soon so that some family members can be contacted and he can be buried under his own name. As with all the Jane and John Doe cases that I cover on this channel, I do hope for the victim's sake and for their family's sake that I can continue to spread their face and their story so more people are aware. And that is where I'm going to end today's video. As always, leave your thoughts on the case down below and if you have any requests of cases you want me to research, always leave them in the comment section. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.